This video is sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc. If you're looking for cards in the US, look no further as you can use the promo code MTGMUDSTA to get you 5% off anything on the site. Or if you're in Canada like me, you can use the same promo code at Multizone to get 10% off your orders of singles. If cards aren't what you're looking for, Original Magic Art has playmats, tokens, and sweet art that you can use that same promo code to help you get 5% off your order there. If you're looking to bling out your cards, using Alter Sleeves is a great way to do so, and you can click the affiliate link in my About section to help out the channel as you make an order. And if you just want to help out the channel, you can always consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month and join the generic Goblin Gang. Hey gang, and welcome back. Today's video is a little bit different since I have my face cam on, and I wanted to test it out while we were doing this top 10 list. As you can tell, I'm pale as a vampire because I work in the basement and don't go outside. To start off, I want to talk about a few honorable mentions that I've been testing out and having fun with. The first being a Moonblessed Cleric. This is actually in my Zedru, Carador, Tristani, and Elsha deck, and it's basically like a Fierce Empath, only it goes on top of the library, so more like an Enlightened Tutor. For 3 mana, it comes with a 3-2 body, which is actually quite good. I kind of do wish it was a 3-1 though for Carador and Skullclamp, but that's beside the point. It's basically a body with Enlightened Tutor on it, is what I'm trying to say. And while 3 mana it doesn't put it to your hand, at least it can come back with something like a Sun Titan, and it's blink fodder for a deck like Brago, or if you're playing Venser. Next up we have Tasha's Hideous Laughter, and this might go into my Garuda deck, assuming I ever build it. Hitting each opponent already makes this card very good, and for 3 mana, considering how deep you can go depending on the meta, this can be a fantastic addition to any mill deck. To get into the top 10, for number 10, we have Forsworn Paladin, and this is a card that I'm going to put into my Villas deck. It's a 1-drop, so it's not the strongest card in the deck, but it can help you ramp. The main reason that I wanted to include it in Villas is because its activated ability causes you to pay life to be able to make a treasure token. On the one hand, you're paying life to make mana, which can then draw you a card with Villas being out, and then you can use that mana to help cast whatever you drew. It's a great card if you have it in your opener, and it's not terrible if you have it late game. Number 9 is you see a pair of goblins, and this is obviously going to go into Krenko. Actually, a lot of the cards on this list are going to go into Krenko. It's an instant speed Krenko's Command, or Dragon Fodder, which already is pretty fantastic, considering it only costs one more mana. It also is a modal spell, meaning that you can either have it make two 1-1 one -one Goblin tokens, or, if you don't need that, pump your board for an instant speed win when you're swinging in combat. Next up is number... 8? Number 8? And that's Inferno of the Star Mounts. This was actually drawn by Jesper Ising, which is a pretty sweet thing despite the fact that he's an awful, awful EDH player and you should never play against him, and I just love dragons. At the very worst, I think we'll probably be seeing this in a lot of Xenagos decks, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Xenobros already have their copies. In the Xenagos deck, it's going to be easy to hit that 20 power threshold, meaning you can smack someone in the face for huge amounts of damage, and at the same time blast another opponent or creature or planeswalker for 20 damage. That's pretty sweet. Next up we have number 7. And that's the Den of Bugbear, and once more this is going to go into Krenko. I'm not a big fan of Manlands and EDH because they mostly come into play tapped, and this really wouldn't replace a Mutavault in the deck, but I definitely cut a Utility Land for it. I really can't imagine a lot of scenarios where this is going to come into play untapped, which is unfortunate, and it does have the downside of its activated ability being 4 mana, which is very steep for a Krenko deck considering how tight you want to be running your mana. It's still just nice to have though because it is a land that can become a goblin and if you attack with it, make a goblin token as well. Number 6 is a Battlecry Goblin, and guess what, it's going into Krenko as well. There are, there are a ton of goodies for Krenko in this set, and having a haste outlet on a body is great, although it is easier to remove than say like Ashling's Prerogative or Fervor. However, the fact that it also pumps those goblins at the same time isn't bad, and it has pack tactics which just helps make more goblin tokens, which is what you want to do anyway. Number 5 is a Hobgoblin Bandit Lord. I find the deck already has a critical mass of lords at this point with like Mountain Walk and Haste and other fun abilities, so in order for it to make the cut it really has to catch my eye, and the Bandit Lord does just that. I think even if the activated ability only hit other creatures, it would still be worth running the deck, so the fact that it targets anything makes it that much sweeter. Number 4 are the class cards, and there's a bunch of them that are really really good. I think Druid class and Warlock class are probably my two favorites, with Druid class finding its way into Titania since it lets me play an extra land drop and gain me life, and Warlock class basically being another copy of Wound Reflection, which, you know, I always want to do. Number 3 is Circle of Dreams Druid. 
This is Gaia's Cradle on a Body. I'm not too sure what else to say about this. You can find it with Green Sun Zenith. You can find it with Court of Calling. You can find it with Demonic Tutor. It comes back with Sun Titan. The list goes on and on as to why this card is so good. And if you've seen it in action, you'll know I'm right. Number two is Oswald Fiddlebender. Once more, this is another example, like the Circle of Dreams Druid, where a really good card has been slapped onto a body. I haven't had a chance to actually play with it since I don't play a lot of white artifacts, but I know that Birthing Pot is typically broken, and there's a lot of broken artifacts in EDH. You put those two facts together, and chances are you'll find a deck you can break this card in. And my number one card from Forgotten Realms is Treasure Vault. Artifact lands have a history of being particularly silly, especially in formats where you can abuse them, and I think Treasure Vault doesn't break from that trend. You can find it with Fabricate, you can find it with Sylvan Scrying. It can be used as a huge mana sink to help your next turn, and it just goes into any deck. It also doesn't hurt that we've gotten a lot of treasure support in the last few sets, so I think this card is going to stick around and do some pretty impressive things. Well gang, that's my top 10 for Forgotten Realms. Well gang, those are my top 10 cards from Forgotten Realms that I've enjoyed playing with or I'm looking forward to testing out. Please be sure to comment what cards you enjoyed out of the set so far and what your top 10 list would have looked like. Until the next one, take care, and don't forget, enemies are just opponents you haven't eliminated yet. This video wouldn't be possible without the help from my sponsors, Cool Stuff Inc., Multizone, Original Magic Art, and Alter Sleeves. But it definitely wouldn't be possible without the help from you, the viewers, and my patrons. So I just want to say thank you for watching, and to remember, friends are just opponents you haven't eliminated yet.